Welcome, my name is Meredith Tui, and I'm the Director of Programmatic Operations at the American Nutrition Association, the ANA. The ANA is very pleased to be hosting Dr. Deanna Minnick in a three-part webinar series around the theme of supporting endocrine health. We would like to thank our sponsors, Symphony Natural Health, for their support in bringing this webinar series to you. Visit their website, symphonynaturalhealth.com, for more information about their positive impact on health and wellness. Today's webinar is titled, Supporting Endocrine Health Emotionally and Mentally, The Science and Art of Aligning Mind, Emotions, and Hormones Through Food and Nutrition. In this webinar, Dr. Deanna Minnick will further develop clinical concepts in hormone health with the complementary aspects of emotions, mental health, and spirituality. The food-mood-spirit relationship will be explored within the context of hormones. Dr. Minnick brings a big picture framework to evaluating and designing personalized protocols for endocrine wellness and hormone health. Foods, nutrients, and bioactives will be presented as physical agents to influence and positively transform moods, behavior, emotions, and consciousness in ways that are healing for the individual. Ancient systems of food energetics will be presented alongside traditional medicine paradigms that consider the energetics of the endocrine operating system. Lifestyle practices that encourage movement, creativity, and authentic expression will be brought into the discussion for consideration in tailoring a personalized plan for a client's mind-spirit wellness. Dr. Minnick is an internationally recognized teacher, author, scientist, speaker, and artist. She has more than 20 years of diverse, well-rounded experience in the fields of nutrition and functional medicine, including clinical practice, research, product formulation, writing, and education. Her doctoral research focused on the essential fatty acid absorption and metabolism, and her master's of science degree allowed her to explore the health benefits of the colorful plant-based carotenoids. She has authored six books on health and wellness and over 40 scientific publications. Currently, she is Vice President of Scientific Affairs for Organic India on the Board of Directors for the American Nutrition Association and faculty for the Institute for Functional Medicine in the University of Western States. She has developed an online certification program for health professionals so that they can apply the color-coded seven systems of full spectrum health in their practice. Her lectures are heard by patients and practitioners throughout the world. Dr. Minnick's passion is teaching a whole self approach to nourishment and bridging the gaps between science, spirituality, and art in medicine. Welcome, Dr. Minnick. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Deanna Minnick, and I'm here to talk with you about how to support endocrine health from the mental emotional aspect. So this is going to be somewhat of a, I would say, a scientific and also an artful creative presentation on how to look at therapeutic tools that actually bridge the physiology and the psychology. So the, these are the objectives for our webinar together. So we want to first unpack stress a little bit and talk about emotional mental health. Of course, since uh, many of you are nutrition professionals or have an interest in nutrition, I'm going to go through the science of food, nutrients, and how those respective pieces influence things like moods, behavior, and emotions. And by the way, I just feel like that's such a fertile ground of additional research and things that we can do clinically. So I am going to bring clinical tracking tools into this discussion. And then I'll just talk very peripherally about lifestyle changes because we know that how we eat is how we live and how we live is how we eat. So we do wanna to bring together the science of food together with the art of lifestyle. So um, yes, lots of different things to cover. And this is a vast topic, but I'm hoping that I keep it more focused and consolidated into connecting the dots for you and really looking at how we can envision moods, neurotransmitters, and hormones as all being interconnected within that food and eating space because we know that they are. If we look at the endocrine system, which is our focus in this webinar, we can see too that there is a psychological emphasis for each of the different glands or the areas of the body that have endocrine activity. So as I go through each of them, I'm going to be highlighting a color and I'm gonna be highlighting the general theme. And you can see what those themes are here. And they are all part of the larger web 
of what I refer to not as the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, but the PH, PT, PH, TP, OTA axis <laughs> that brings together all of the endocrine glands into one big hole, because truly they are all interrelated. They are a symphony. You can think of each of these as playing notes within the symphony of our being. And so if one of them is off, it's out of tune for the whole of our inner music, right? Just to use a metaphor there, it starts to sound flat, sound out of tune, and we have to get them all in harmony again. So let's start with the adrenal hormones. And again, the way that we're diving into each of these portals is through the emotional mental space. When we think of this word stress, I would say that the research term and where we're going with stress literature is more within the realm of resilience. So if we can be thinking about stress and resilience side by side, we know that there are peak aspects to where we function well with stress, but if it goes too high or if it's too low, it can be uh, counterbalancing. And so one of the things is, especially as you start to work with people in more of that therapeutic encounter setting is to look at where we perceive stressors in our life, because stress is not just an absolute. There are certain things that are just stressful for everybody. Things like a war, things like poverty, um, may be very stressful for many people, right? A lot of these larger societal planetary aspects, natural disasters. However, there are some cases where we get into the nuance of stress, where we look at, well, flying is stressful for some, but not for all. Public speaking might be stressful for some, but not for all. So how can we look at stress in a very personalized way? Of course, with the American Nutrition Association, we focus on personalized nutrition. And I do think that there's a space to talk about personalized stress responses, how our body responds and what are we responding to? So these three aspects, which were, I would say, uh, really coined or at least codified by Hans Selye, in the early 20th century is really looking at the stages of stress. And again, I'm just bringing this back just to kind of get us all on the same page before we get into the foods, because depending on where a client is with their stage of stress and where they have been may determine the extent of nutritional intervention that they need. So everything from more temporal acute aspects of arousal and alarm, kind of like, you know, you, you get into an almost car accident, kind of like feeling that rush of, oh my gosh, what if, and, you know, stepping on the brakes and feeling that rush of cortisol, the catecholamines actually uh, would be the first responders. And then let's just say that somebody has longer term chronic stress. This is where we really start to get concerned from a nutritional angle because for the most part, we can recover from those acute bouts of stress if we're properly fortified. But when we get into the chronic aspects of high cortisol and sustained release of cortisol, we start to really start to, um, I would say tamper or uh, alter things like insulin and glucose in not so favorable ways. And we set the stage for things like cardiometabolic syndrome. And then the final stage is the exhaustion depletion state where we have low cortisol, we can't get out of bed in the morning, we start to see immune compromised states where people can't recover, they can't come back from infections, they just continue to get ill. So I think for you to be thinking in terms of okay, when I'm meeting with a client, not that you're diagnosing uh, their endocrine function, per se, you're looking at their functionality in everyday life as it relates to their relationship with stress that will help you as it relates to nutrition. Now, this is basically showing you what I just spoke to, but more in a brain way, because um, keep in mind that, you know, there's a lot of talk about the the adrenal fatigue, the adrenal exhaustion that people feel. And if we go back upstream rather than downstream to the adrenals, we can see that stress starts in the brain. That's why I say that we really need to look at our perspective on stress. And not only that, one of the other things that we have learned from other researchers in the field of telomeres and epigenetics, people like Dr. Elissa Eppel, 
where we can see that there is a transgenerational effect of stress. In other words, the stress that we may feel may not actually be our, our own. So we have to be looking at how can we continue to work through the many layers of stress in our lives and how they connect to food and a number of other peripheral issues around food. Now, I'm very interested, and I bet you are too, uh, in behavior design and behavior change. What makes people act? Is it their physiology that creates a certain reactivity or is it their psychology that is priming their physiology? And, and I think that there's a bi-directional flow here. This is a very interesting article from the standpoint of looking at inflammation. So when I tend to think of somebody who's highly stressed, has increased risk for cardiometabolic issues, they have high cortisol, high insulin, I tend to think of this as a more pro-inflammatory state. And what this article spoke, spoke to was really looking at how inflammation being pro-inflammatory at the cellular level may actually be creating uh, a change in our psychology. It may be changing how we focus and whether or not we're impulsive and whether or not we can delay gratification. So I just think that that's worthwhile to mention that what is our stress coming from? Number one, is there a perception there? Number two, and number three, is there a bodily physiological issue that we can resolve or at least help to mitigate with nutrition to bring down the level of reactivity, impulsivity, and inability to focus? So indeed, I bet you've seen this, that stress can get in the way of eating healthy and further when we eat unhealthy, when we're eating a lot of ultra processed foods, this can create more inflammation and stress. So stress doesn't have to come from an event per se, where it's an exchange with a person or some type of environmental issue. It can come from food. So how can we help to reduce some of the stress that comes along with a I would say a nutrient poor diet or a nutrient devoid diet, we can be causing a lot of that inflammation and stress. So what do we do? What are the actionables? Well, what I would say is in as much as we can as nutrition professionals help to quell the inflammatory signals from food when we are stressed. In fact, that's when clients need it the most. They need to eat the best when they are the most stressed or at least leading up to the stress, if we are in the mode of doing fairly well with our eating and our lifestyle, then we can be a bit more resilient and bounce back better. So if somebody hasn't quite done that, or they do varying degrees of that, I think that there's always room for improvement, looking at how we cook food, making sure that we have less in the way of highly processed carbohydrates, high glycemic index, high glycemic load, a lot of refined sweeteners, looking at the quality of fats that we take in. And me personally, what I tend to look at when I'm talking with people is what is the color palette of their dietary pattern? If I look down at their plate, what colors am I seeing? And to me, when I see brown, yellow, and white, I begin to think of high aging, high inflammation, and and high stress signals. Now that, that isn't that we of course can have some healthy brown, yellow, and white foods. However, when we see those as being processed or not complemented by the whole palette of different phytonutrients to help us at the cellular level with stress response, then I start to get concerned and I want to reel them back into again, focusing on the rainbow. Looking at food intolerances, sensitivities, and even allergies can also be helpful because what allergies can do, environmental and or food, is they can in and of themselves upregulate the inflammatory signal and response in the body. So indeed, blood sugar is core to our metabolic health, to our ability to be endocrine healthy is what I would say, you know, if, if with the endocrine system, we want a very good foundation. And that foundation starts with the adrenals in proper communication with the brain and the brain signaling back to the adrenals. One of the ways to streamline that communication is to reduce the amount of interferers, as I would call them, things that interfere, like all of these foods that are high glycemic index, they're just adding fuel to the fire. 
So this is a short list of some of the ideas of how to support the physical body for adrenal health. Of course, looking at our macros, healthy protein, healthy fat, carbohydrate, even making sure that we've got the prebiotic fibers, we've got good complex carbohydrates, and even carbohydrates found in vegetables. Making sure that we have healthy protein is important too for helping with blood sugar response. And of course, healthy quality fats to inform the cell membrane to in order that cell to properly communicate and transport and also to excrete what it no longer needs. When it comes to vitamins, we wanna be thinking about the whole array of B complex. So all of the B vitamins, none of them are insignificant when it comes to stress, because when we're stressed, we are revving metabolic cycles. So to keep in mind that when we have that emotional, in that mental aspect of stress, this is physically depleting. We are changing our metabolic cycle. So bringing in the B complex as well as vitamin C. And of course, the, the whole spectrum of minerals, especially magnesium and zinc. Magnesium to help us with metabolism and relaxation can also help with methylation and a number of other aspects. And then zinc, I think about the immune system, wound healing, repairing the mucous membranes. Zinc is used for thousands of reactions in the body. So it's not like we're just isolating it to, to just one, but really looking at how needs for certain vitamins and minerals do go up when we are stressed over time. And then here's one that I think many people overlook, and that is hydration. Yes, water <laughs> and water from all sources. There was a statistic that I read recently stating that it was estimated that 75% of Americans are dehydrated, 75%. And if you think of our bodies, the majority of our, our bodies are water. We are mostly water weight, 60 to 70%. And there are certain parts of the body that are more water rich, like the brain. So as we become more dehydrated, we're not drinking throughout the day. We don't have things in our water, like proper pH, proper minerals. You may or may not have heard of Sole, which is a super saturated Himalayan crystal salt solution. So with the 84 different minerals in this, this saturated solution, adding that into water and then drinking that. I do that just first thing in the morning. One of the first things I do, I am not very regular about my daily routine, but there is one thing that I do when I wake up and that is I drink water and further I drink sole. I want to be sure that I have the salts and I have the water together properly complexed. And if we think of how, you know, we just spent eight hours in bed, uh, you know, our circulation is needs to rev up. We need to start circulating fluids. This is important. It's important for adrenal health because the glucocorticoids, so cortisol, is connected to the mineral corticoids, which are connected to the overall uh, salt balance, the, the overall, I would say, fluid balance of the body. So many times when people are overly stressed, they can become dehydrated, whether they're just urinating more or they're just not being attentive to hydration. So that's just one place to start. So I have this slide on water. Again, looking at the whole array of different ways that we can get in water. So tap water, making sure that it is purified. You know, that is one thing to be discussing with your clients, of course, is making sure that we have good, healthy, non-toxic water, fruits, juices, sauces, soups, teas, and broths, getting some variability. I, I do think that people they get bored just drinking water as is. So having some kind of electrolytes, again, changing, having more um, natural spring water, you know, a lot of these different things can be helpful to ensuring that we have proper hydration. And there are going to be different categories of clients that are going to be more susceptible to dehydration, like people of an older age, people with more diarrhea or more bowel movements. So they're losing fluid with those bowel movements, especially if it's more on the diarrhea side, they're vomiting, they're using certain medications, maybe they're athletes. So they're sweating certain times of year, like the summer months, we are going to be more prone to dehydration. 
So I have here a list of the different deficiency symptoms. It could be all, all kinds of things. And from a nutrition physical exam perspective, you can be looking at the obvious, looking at lips and dryness, looking at skin and skin tinting. These are things that definitely, you know, just looking at somebody can tell you whether or not they might be experiencing dehydration. All right, so let's move on from the adrenal hormones, connecting the dots now into the mental, um, the, the emotional mental sphere of the reproductive hormones. And uh, as many of you probably have heard me talk about my own story of how being a woman, being creative, needing to really have a voice and um, allow how I, how I was really feeling to come out into the open, I you know, for, for myself, words and talking just didn't fulfill what I was looking for from an expressive point of view. So I needed to do it through color and through painting. And you might find, I'm going to circle back at the end of this presentation with some ideas for how to help your clients to be more creative. I think that within the emotional mental sphere, that creativity can be a divining rod to unlocking those respective components within us. And I, I speak about that more, I would say from a personal standpoint, the literature also supports that uh, within looking at expressive arts and some of the science of what it can do physiologically. So if we just think of a woman's life cycle and all of the hormonal fluxes that she may be going through, through the different stages of her life, the different decades, every month, if she's menstruating, and how we may see fluxes there. Then she goes through pregnancy. Postpartum can also foster different mood states, perhaps due to changes and reequilibration of, of hormones. Perimenopause, which can be a long duration of anywhere from five to 15 years. And in some cases, even longer, in some cases shorter, but that's a long duration to have this flux. And then post-menopause, therefore, a, a woman going through these endocrine shifts, she may need different attention aspects to her mood and to her food to help her be better equilibrate and help her find back that inner symphony. So this is a, a basic schematic of the monthly cycle. And, you know, I, I think even for me, I'm always learning things about the menstrual cycle as we get more within the science of how these different hormones come together, estrogen, progesterone, how women can read their bodies better and how they can start to map their mood to their bodies. You know, there are great apps for this now where you can go and start tracking where you're at with respect to the follicular phase, the preovulatory phase, ovulation, and then the luteal phase. And I do think that helping to educate women on their physiology can help them to understand why they feel a certain way, why they may have certain eating tendencies during certain times of the month. And so it's really connecting in the emotional side, the physical side, and the food nutritional aspects. In fact, with you as a nutrition professional, potentially, if, if you are one listening, going through nutrition can help with, again, balancing the emotional, physical landscape that she might be going through on a monthly basis. And we know that there, there is this sense of premenstrual changes within mood. This is referred to as PMS, PMDD, and this can be due to changes in sex hormones, but it can also be primed, I would say, through food and lifestyle. So we really do need a magnifying glass, or, you know, just metaphorically speaking, to ask them about what are their behaviors earlier in the month before they get their period later in the month. Just if we think of the, the cycle one to 28 days. So on day one, what are you doing? Because every day of the cycle is relevant for informing the next day in the overall health of the menstrual cycle and, and how we feel. And if a woman is trying to get pregnant and let's just say that she's infertile, this can further impact her mental, emotional health. And that can further interrelate back into this sense of stress 
having anxiety and depression. So here's where connecting food into things like mindfulness may be helpful. And even bringing in mindfulness through the portal of eating might be where you feel comfortable from a scope of practice perspective. Binge eating is, is something that you might see with clients, especially uh, for, for women who do experience some degree of premenstrual tension or stress. And so looking at the health of her endocrine system and mapping that to her eating patterns, I mean, that is just, just to really get into that and just to create a food log for a month and to have that connected to a woman's cycle, the day of her cycle, I think can really shine a light on why or where or when there would be certain mood imbalances. And maybe to be a little bit more forgiving with ourselves during certain times of the month too, right? Not to have the bar set so high, but through that process of understanding our physiology, we become much more knowledgeable and then that informs our choices. So more information, like Dr. Jeff Land has said, I remember him saying this, if you don't measure it, you don't change it. I do think we need to be not overly analytical. We need some basic level of understanding of our bodies so that we can better have the, the type of behaviors that we want to have those certain emotional, mental mood states. So I just want to bring up here this whole aspect of plant-based hormones. Throughout everything that we're eating, animal and plant, we are going to have these different hormones that come in. Some of them are endocrine disruptors, and we don't want those. However, there are some that help with better modulating our physiology that may even be helpful as it relates to establishing better balance with things like our sex hormones, because they're tickling certain receptors like the estrogen receptor beta that has more of a balancing effect in, uh, within the cell. Now, keep in mind too, that not everybody has the same response to phytoestrogens. And this is really, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's talked about enough in the literature. You know, after all, when we look at things like dietary guidelines, there isn't a lot of discussion about how the gut microbiome could change those dietary guidelines. So in, if you look at some of the literature on phytoestrogens, they can be potentiated through the interaction with the gut microbiome. So not everybody has the same response from these, and that might be, be because they have a different gut microbiome composition. So when you think reproductive health, be thinking of gut health and how those two areas of the body really do come together. So the endocrine system is very closely tied to the gastrointestinal system as you might anticipate, especially considering that many of these hormones are produced in large amounts within the gut. Neurotransmitters, hormones, um, things like melatonin are produced in the gut and many times in, in several times greater amounts than produced by the actual endocrine gland, the pineal gland. That's just one, one example, just the melatonin, but there, there are others. So we do need to look at the gut. Essential fatty acids are really important to help the overall cellular milieu to make sure that the cellular dynamics are properly functioning, right? You need a proper structure to inform the function. So checking in on dietary sources of essential fatty acids, you might have to be asking about their food preferences and sources here because there are vegan sources versus animal sources. And so I'm sure that you're well aware of that. So it, it is important to be bringing in conversation about good, healthy fats and the balance of those fats as it relates to the flow and fluidity of the endocrine system overall. So I have here just a little snapshot for you on omega-3s, and I'm sure that you know a lot about omega-3s. I bring it in because my, my PhD research was on essential fatty acids. So any opportunity I have to be talking about essential fatty acids, I'm going to do that because it's something that, again, uh, is, is needed by everybody. We need proper amounts of healthy balance of these omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. We need them both and we need them in the proper ratio. 
And so you can be looking at dietary sources, looking at a, a general balance, looking at meals and how if, if you're seeing that your client is exhibiting things like changes in their skin, their hair, their eyes, fertility, they're fatigued, cognitive changes, um, they have high inflammation, even mood issues uh, are connected to omega-3s. We want to be thinking um, about this particular macronutrient overall, just fats in general, but then drilling that down a bit to look at the sources. All right, moving on from the reproductive hormones, let's look at the gut as an emotional mental center. In fact, uh, I, I think that the gut is extremely, I would say intuitive. And you know, you've even heard that phrase, trust your gut. Well, there, there's something very emotional. You know, when we have a, a strong emotions, many times our gut responds. So how do we connect in emotions to the gut and to food? Well, first and foremost, I begin thinking if I'm connecting those dots, I start thinking of leaky gut. I begin thinking about how when we have stressful states, we may change the structure and function of the gut. This is where people may start to exhibit things like upper gastric type of symptoms like reflux or ulcers or uh, downstream effects, things like changes in bowel movements or indigestion, bloating, they're not, they're not able to digest and assimilate their food properly. So we do need to connect the dot of the adrenals to the reproductive hormones to the gut, right? And, and so cortisol is that direct interconnection. And remember that what I mentioned in the adrenal section about how if we're eating a meal, that has a lot of inflammatory signals, this can actually change the milieu of the gut. We can see things like metabolic endotoxemia, where we have the production of endotoxins by the microorganisms in the gut as a response to contents of a meal, typically very high fat, low quality foods. Uh, sometimes you could see this in people who are following a very poor quality ketogenic diet, and that might be, there's some literature to suggest that there's a connection there as well. And then of course, looking at how leaky gut may be connected to things like leaky ovaries, leaky uterus, right? Because they're all sharing that same very close anatomical space. So indeed stress can connect into how we process the energy that we're taking in from food stress can lead to insulin resistance. So when we have those catecholamines, things like adrenaline and noradrenaline, this can lead to a need in the body for energy. So we start to increase free fatty acids for energy because we're liberating these free fatty acids. Well, these can be where we see free radical activity. We start to see more oxidative stress more inflammation. And similarly with the glucocorticoids, so things like cortisol, this will stimulate more glucose and insulin because again, the, the body under a state of stress is looking for energy. So be thinking about connecting the adrenals directly to insulin sensitivity and or resistance. We see that in the literature, chronic stress is an independent risk factor for decreased insulin sensitivity. Be asking your type two diabetics about their stress level. That would be the obvious connection there, the endocrine emotional mental interface. And it's also been suggested that early life adversity, so looking at adverse childhood experiences can lead to lifelong metabolic disturbances. Not to say that we can't get in and begin to change those experiences and the bodily experience through nutrition and lifestyle, but we first have to, I would say, be informed as to the, the exact traumas and the intensity, the experience for that individual client. And if that's not something that you feel comfortable with, it makes sense to refer out to have a, a more extended health team to address those in particular, because uh, again, what we're doing is focusing on the nutrition and looking at lifestyle as it connects to nutrition. Now on the heels of talking about nutrition, one of the things that can help to repair the gut, nourish the gut would be fiber. 
And, you know, I think we all need to fall in love with fiber again, because fiber has had this pigeonholing of just being for gut motility and constipation, it's roughage, it keeps you regular. However, in the light of the current science, what we see is that different types of fibers have personalized effects in the gut. You know, just like us being very high, highly individualized, fibers of all types have different types of effects, which is why clinically speaking, I'm always advocating rotation of fibers, not to just hammer on one type of fiber, but to get the complexity of fiber, to get the complexity of microorganisms. And we know that those microorganisms will then change things like mood. So you can actually change emotional mental health just by working through the endocrine landscape of the gut through the portal, the nutritional portal of fiber. So don't think that that is too simplistic. You know, all of the different pathways that you're rippling through just by having more fiber, whether it's food-based fibers, supplemental fibers, that's for you to determine with your clients, but even having that level of entry is significant for, for mood and mental health. So here's a, a quick overview, really looking at, I would say, more of the physiological effects of fiber, showing how it may help with appetite, promoting fullness. And, and that can help too, especially when people are feeling more emotionally volatile and labile, they might resort to emotional eating. So having more fiber can help with satiety signals so that they are more satisfied with what they're eating and that they're not constantly going to more processed carbohydrates and, and quick, um, I would say sugar sources or ways to get energy. They also change motility in the gut, you know, just really I, the way I see it, even from a, an emotional mental point of view is that it gives us a sense of being nourished. It fills us up at the gut level. And so that's going to lead to a slower release of sugar from what we're taking in, in the diet. So the more complex carbohydrates and, and how they're being broken down and slowly released into the blood so that we have more even mood rather than the spikes of blood sugar that can lead to again, more inflammation, potentially more reactivity and, um, more, I would say emotional lability based on those curves. Fiber also helps to lower blood lipids, adds bulk. And of course, what I was just talking about with the gut microbiome, it's going to inform the population that's living within the gut. Then those microorganisms are going to have a ripple through effect of so many changes, including that of mood and even into our mental state. So case in point, you know, this was a great review article. I always get questions about fruit. Deanna, what do I do with fruit? Is that a good thing? And I think we do have to assess somebody's insulin resistance or just where they're at with their glycemic load. Of course, the more fibrous fruits and vegetables uh, may, may be important and we don't want to cut them out completely. There just may be better sources for the individual depending on their blood sugar and how they respond. So in this particular review article, they were looking at the odds ratio for depressive symptoms, which is on the Y axis and how much fiber they were taking in on the X axis below. And what they saw cumulatively was that with greater amounts of fiber, there were less depressive symptoms. Now, there could be a lot of reasons for why that is, but in general, when we are having more fiber, it's going to help with mood states. There is that, that correlation. And in fact, I would say that all of us might be interested in keeping our eye on what we're seeing as it relates to psychobiotics. Psychobiotics, I, I love this term, psycho meaning more psychological, looking at neurotransmitters, hormones, and looking at how there can be certain probiotics that may impact our mental state, our depressive and uh, anxiety type symptoms, just by the nature of the microorganism and potentially what they're producing as metabolites. So I, I think that we are still a ways out from looking at therapeutic impacts here uh, in the form of a dietary supplement. But I do think that we will start to see 
certain ones of these gain some traction. All right, moving up into the heart, into the cardiovascular, renal or kidney aspects. So the heart by nature of being the heart, <laughs> everybody thinks of, you know, the heart and love and, you know, the heart is in some ways um, very much connected to emotions. And uh, we, we see how the heart is one of the first responders when it comes to stress, of course, you know, catecholamines uh, impact things, blood flow. In the way that I like to think about the body, uh, I know that it's a very simple way is to look at how the heart is connected to the microbiota, so to the gut and the motility, but then also to the brain and how these three major centers, which then co I would say coincide with the endocrine system, are all in super highway communication. And for some of us, when we're stressed, we feel it more in the heart. We feel it more in our circulatory system. We might get more anxious, whereas other people might feel it more in the brain through worry or mental distress, or some may feel it more in the gut where they get changes in bowel movements or how they digest. So indeed, we cannot overlook the heart as it relates to the emo emotional and mental aspects of our being. And anybody can tell you um, that the, the, uh, the impact of stressors on, and how emotions do register within the heart. So from a, an endocrine perspective, looking at the role of these catecholamines, the first responders. So I think of these as more the neurotransmitter hormone interface, looking at epinephrine, and which is also known as adrenaline and how it's released during stressful events quickly because we need to have some changes in heart rate and how, how the heart is contracting and helping us to accommodate within that stress. And then also the norepinephrine side, also known as noradrenaline and helping with um, the, the vasoconstriction with blood pressure. Uh, it's also used as a bronchodilator. So really bringing together blood flow, the kidney, looking at blood pressure and how blood pressure can be changing with these, these endocrine effects. I love the, the research from HeartMath Institute in, in which we see how heart rate can change depending on our emotional state. They have done such an excellent job of publishing research on this particular topic. So if we start from the, from the, the top and then move to the bottom, you can see how tracking heart rate and just looking at the, the flow and the flux of that heart rate rhythm, how when we're trying to focus on something versus when we're angry and how that heart rate looks different, the curves, the peaks, the valleys look different. Then we go into relaxation where we have more rhythmicity. And then at the bottom here, looking at when we have appreciation. So to me, when I think of appreciation, it's almost like a value add or something that adds to our emotional health when we have a relaxed state, but then we layer in appreciation. It's, it's even better. And so bringing this into the meal, it's the how of eating. So when people are eating rather than eat in these stress states where cortisol is up, insulin is up, glucose is, is circulating, how can we help them to recognize how impactful even being in a state of appreciation is as they are about to eat and how that can ultimately affect their endocrine system and can bring in more harmony to their symphony. So here you see um, another study from the heart math group, Dr. McCready, and you can see two people coming together that are expressing appreciation for each other. And what you can see is that these heart rate patterns, look at how they beautifully synchronize with each other. So I don't know if you've ever done this clinically, but um, I did it when I was at the Functional Medicine Research Center some years ago. I did it with select people in which I would hook them up to a heart rate variability device while we had a conversation about food, which you can also, and very, very insightful to marry together heart rate or heart rate variability 
with nutrition and food and eating. This is another one of those intersections that hasn't been talked a lot about. And for some people, they're wearing continuous heart rate variability monitors. So they're going to get a lot of information on what changes their heart rate variability. And in my opinion, the heart doesn't lie. It's really valuable data to figure out where is my heart when I'm eating? And how can I find myself into appreciation as a positive, fulfilling, nourishing emotion as I embark upon eating that meal? So here are some nutrients for heart health and healthy circulation of blood. I just made a, a short list. I'm sure that you can even come up with many more. And uh, so these are the ones that I would say very targeted. You know, we, we think of magnesium across multiple systems, but there definitely can be um, magnesium to help in relaxing the muscles, help with the, the heart as a muscle. Vitamin K, which I believe is the next vitamin D to help with placement of things like calcium and looking at how vitamin K, especially vitamin K2 works with vitamin D and calcium as well as magnesium. It's kind of like they're uh, a diamond working together, this intersection of these four nutrients. Folate, of course, to help with things like bringing down homocysteine. And of course, we need other B vitamins for that. Folate can help us with um, just establishing more healthy patterns of methylation, which can ultimately help with things like our vasculature. Leafy greens, crucifers, um, helping with high blood pressure, looking at hypertension, nitrates, sulfur containing foods, also helping with blood pressure, platelet aggregation. You know, I remember reading a study some years ago about how daily hassles, that's how it was contextualized in the study. So feeling like you're, you've got all these hassles, you're perturbed and how that was connected into uh, changes in the blood, you know? So do we actually get more uh, changes, inflammatory changes within our vasculature, within our, um, within our platelets, within our red blood cells, you know, all of these things add up under states of stress or emotional distress. So having things that keep the blood fluid and flowing, that's the name of the game with the endocrine system. We want a flow of communication signals. So having a lot of these greens, folate, B vitamins, omega-3s, again, will help with that flow and, and not to forget hydration, the obvious one, right? To help to give us the substance to enable the flow. So here I have magnesium, all the many different facets around magnesium. I don't know what it is, but so many nutrition professionals love magnesium. <laughs> Every time I'm looking at social media and I see, oh, magnesium, we love magnesium. It's used for 300 plus reactions in the body. I mean, it is great. And, you know, I think we like magnesium because it makes us feel differently. I know when I take magnesium, and I've heard this from clients as well, is that when people are taking magnesium, they actually feel more relaxed. And that makes sense from a physiological perspective that we're relaxing the muscles, we're getting a bit more energy, we're reducing fatigue. And so it can be all kinds of um, different portals into why magnesium is, is helping us there, you know, from the heart perspective, from the stress perspective, lots of different angles to take it into. So looking at food sources of magnesium to ensure that our clients are getting enough and if appropriate to assess whether or not dietary supplementation is warranted. And if you're able to do that, all right, moving up into the thyroid, we know that the thyroid requires nutrients for activity. In fact, a lot of nutrients. It's amazing how small this gland is, this endocrine gland is and how potent it is and how it changes so many different facets of our, of our being. It changes our metabolism. It changes our body temperature. It works very closely with the heart as it relates to circulation and stress response. So what do we need to know as nutrition professionals? Well, we need a number of nutrients for thyroid hormone synthesis, just to even make thyroid hormone. Look at everything that we need. We need B vitamins. We need vitamin C, D, and E. We need minerals like iodine, iron, selenium, and zinc, and we need tyrosine and amino acid to help with the formation. That's actually, you know, we, we need to, to form that, uh, hormone itself. 
So moving the T4, the inactive thyroid hormone to the active T3, we need other sets of nutrients potentially. So things like selenium and zinc are important there. And that conversion we see throughout the body and different tissues. And then what about receptivity? Well, vitamin A and zinc from a nutritional aspect can help to improve cellular sensitivity as well as exercise. So, you know, I haven't even talked about exercise, but there is a beautiful complement between what we do with nutrition and how we connect that to physical activity. Now, emotional stress can impair this very important conversion from the inactive to the active form of thyroid hormone. And so what can happen is we can even produce a metabolically inactive form of thyroid hormone, and that can be measured on lab panels as reverse T3. And one of the things that can lead to that conversion of T4 to reverse T3 could be stress. And also just think of other aspects like inflammation, which could come from stress or we're eating inflammatory signals, toxins, there can be a number of different things, but I don't want us to neglect or ignore the fact that emotional stress can even impair how we convert into uh, inactive to active thyroid hormone. So stress really ripples through us, doesn't it? Our emotions prime our behaviors and perpetuate certain things. So really having that nexus and looking at what people are eating and how they're feeling is so important. So what I have here are just some um, general ideas of how can we nourish the thyroid? Well, one of the ways might be to have more mineral rich foods, more foods that are rich with iodine, especially. So I have here a short list of some of the sea plants. Now, as you know, the American audience, for the most part, is not very well versed in these kinds of foods. Now, if we were uh, working with people from Japan, or even Taiwan, there is much more acknowledgement of using sea plants in the way of soups and broths and having that as part of stir fry noodle dish. But we don't have a lot of that. Uh, and so <laughs> you might have to work on some creative strategies to incorporate more minerals, more of the iodine and selenium in safe ways into the diet of somebody that you're working with. And it's really key to mention too that iodine and selenium need to be in healthy balance. And so I do think for many nutrition professionals, uh, it's, it's more, you know, I, I, I always go to food first and I'm sure that you do too. And I think that unless you're able to measure things like iodine or selenium and a lot of the, the different thyroid hormone markers, um, that you should be very careful and conscientious about any form of supplementation because um, bringing in iodine with imbalanced levels of selenium, that can create some, some thyroid dysfunction or some changes there, some imbalance. So this is a, a list of dietary sources of iodine. So we see up at the top, quite a range for seaweeds. You know, I wonder about that term seaweed. <laughs> you know, it's just plants that grow in the ocean that have these, these properties, um, high in iodine, high in minerals. When we think of selenium, one of the best sources of selenium would be Brazil nuts, definitely a very rich source of, of selenium. Keep in mind that you can go too high in selenium, even dietary selenium. So the tolerable upper level that has been established for selenium is 400 micrograms. So just to keep that in mind, um, you know, again, always working with other practitioners. Um, if, if you need that adjunctive support, food first, looking at the overall dietary pattern and referring out when you feel it's necessary. So let us uh, close with the final part of the circuit, the hypothalamic pituitary pineal hormones. And these are, I would say, heavy hitters even though they're all a symphony and each one has its own hormonal cascade and, and the, 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 the different music that each of them are singing, 
However, we do know that a lot is happening in the brain. And many times what is happening in the brain is informing the downstream signals. So in many ways, this is like, in part, that can be the conductor of this symphony. So being up in the brain, we do need to think about mental health and brain health. Not many people think that the brain can get sick or that the brain needs to be treated like the other organs. It's kind of revered as uh, a separate entity, but it, it really does share a lot of different features that you see across other organs like leakiness. So it has a very um, secure, selective blood brain barrier, much like the gut. And so what we tend to see in the scientific literature is that in depressed patients, there is evidence of increased blood brain barrier permeability. In other words, this leaky brain kind of concept. And through this compromised blood brain barrier, what you can see is an infiltration of inflammatory cytokines and chemokines that can change neurochemistry. So when there are mood changes, when there is depression, when there is anxiety, we need to be again, thinking about inflammation. And when we think of inflammation going into what a potential root cause could be, which could be high cortisol. So looking at stress because high cortisol is correlated with increased risk for dementia. And also, you know, and in a short-term basis, stress can help us to think better, but on a longer term basis, it can reduce cognition. We can see worse episodic and spatial memory, reduce ex, ex, um, executive function, impairments in language, processing speed, and social cognition. So it's worthwhile to be looking at whether or not somebody has underlying stress concerns, if they also have cognitive changes, or if you have a client who's very interested in proving their their cognitive capacity to be looking at stress, to be looking at nutrition, healthy nutrition for the stress response, and to be cultivating more resilience through lifestyle. So as you can see, I took this quote here from this article, in cognitively healthy subjects, higher cortisol levels have been associated with an increased risk of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. Subjects with dementia and mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease have been found to have higher cerebral spinal fluid levels of cortisol than cognitively healthy controls. So we do need to address stress. And we, again, can help to turn that corner with stress with many nutritional interventions. So with prolonged stress, there can be mood disorders, and ultimately there can be some form of changes in neurochemistry, even leading to neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's and or Parkinson's. So I think it's, again, really important to be evaluating stress at all levels of the endocrine system, which is why we have this, this focus on the emotional mental aspects. So the neurotoxic effects of stress. So those glucocorticoids, when they're chronically expressed can be changing up the neurochemistry where you can see more in the way of reactive oxygen species. So that's greater oxidative stress. You get greater potentially um, DNA changes through that. Uh, you can get changes in neuronal dysfunction, neuroinflammation, and you can get epigenetic changes in things like the glucocorticoid receptors, or even the brain derived neurotropic factor expression and so forth. So there can be these pleiotropic effects just from stress. And when you start to change the neurons, you start to change the brain matter, and then you start to change functionality. Now, the good thing about what we know about the brain now is that the brain is constantly shaping and sculpting, and it's much more resilient than we thought it was back in the 20th century. So we can be changing the brain through nutrition and through lifestyle, and that's where you come in. Estrogen can have an effect on neurons, and I wanted to mention that as well. This is an interesting tidbit about estrogen. And in fact, it's kind of interesting because estrogen works throughout the brain. There are different types of receptors in the brain, and it may even modulate the activity of neurotransmitters. It's changing nerve growth factors. It may be enhancing dendritic outgrowth, changing cerebral blood flow, 
And so lots of different physical, physiological changes that may in fact translate to more psychological aspects and mood states. So when a woman is going through perimenopause, there can be some changes in mood and even cognition. And this is where having foods that modulate and nourish the the endocrine circuit, this can help to ease her into that stage of life and not have such amplified symptoms that relate to her mood. So how do we do that? How do we harmonize the hypothalamus talking to the pituitary? How do we do that through food and even through supplements? Well, first and foremost, the the major component of the brain from a nutritional angle is fat. Most of our brain is lipid. We also have a high water content. So let's not again, forget hydration. So enriching the structure of the brain with omega-3 fatty acids to help with the flow and transport of neurotransmitters and hormones. And then we also have to think about how do we produce more of those neurotransmitters and hormones? Well, we're going to need more of the macronutrients, especially amino acids, which form the, the, I would say the skeleton or the bedrock of many of these neurotransmitters and hormones, as well as the cofactors like vitamins and minerals. And then plant compounds. There are many different plant derived actives. And one in particular that I'm thinking of that has been clinically tested is one from maca, a very specific type of maca, Peruvianum lipidium, which can help with um, really modulating the hypothalamic pituitary nexus to help to better regulate the endocrine circuit. And so looking at things like uh, FSH, LH, looking at these type of brain uh, type of endocrine hormones, then regulating the rest of her cycle and helping to, I would say, modulate that in such a way so that it's not such a bumpy ride on that roller coaster. So the 12 nutrients for better mood, I just want to call those out. Of course, I think that all nutrients are important nutrition and getting that firm foundation. And I'm going to do a quick recap at the end on macros, micros, and phytos. But in general, I wanted to showcase this as it relates to mental health, because Dr. Lachance and Dr. Drew Ramsey have done a nice job of really looking at an evidence-based approach to antidepressant foods and looking at what are some nutrients that would be key for a better mood. So this is their list of the 12 different nutrients. And then what they did is they looked at the different food categories to assess their levels of those nutrients to then give them an antidepressant food score. So the higher that food score, that AFS, the more in the way of those nutrients they would contain. So you can see vegetables are at the top of this list, followed by organ meats, followed by fruits, then down to seafood. When you break apart the animal foods on the left, the plant foods on the right, you can see some of the, the ones that are in the higher range. Now, this is not something that I think, oh, everybody just needs to have a bunch of watercress and they're going to feel better. I do think that we have to embrace the complexity of one's emotional, mental landscape from within. It's not just about nutrients, but nutrients can form, again, that proper foundation. And I do think that not just a colorful plate of foods, but also having diversity is important to ensure better nutritional status. Now of the plant compounds. um, Now, one of the things about the maca that I mentioned, that's really interesting is that um, that maca uh, and nourishing the hypothalamic pituitary nexus seems to be higher in glucosinolates, which we know that broccoli and cruciferous vegetables also have. So looking at how glucosinolates then play with other mood type of aspects in plants like the flavonoids. Flavonoids are very intriguing. They're a different category of phytonutrients. And it's been thought that they are potent mood modulators. So um, if you look, in fact, the, the research has been out for some time. So what we see is that in many cases, these plant flavones or these flavonoids, they bind to receptors that would help with reducing anxiety. 
So in essence, these plant foods can help us to modulate mood better. So what I have in here for you is a list of those high flavonoid foods and beverages. So look at that, cacao, chocolate. You know, maybe we reach for chocolate or high cocoa products when we are needing a little bit of that more psychoactive mood modulating type of activity. You know, I, I don't think many people think about it like that. And there can be a lot of other things in chocolate that people are after like the sugar, but there is something redeeming in cocoa and cacao with respect to mood. Now, from a, um, another nutritional angle, high tryptophan foods can also be important for helping to support healthy levels of serotonin as well as melatonin, because remember that tryptophan does help to create serotonin, which helps to create melatonin. So making sure that we have enough protein, protein can then help with stabilizing blood sugar. We need protein. We need protein at every meal. In fact, I was just talking with a client not too long ago and realizing that, you know, not everybody creates protein as their centerpiece of their meal. Like some people just don't even have adequate protein with meals. And if we want a healthy mood, we need protein at every meal. We also need protein for healthy metabolic detoxification. So it depends on, you know, the individual, what their choice forms of protein would be and whatever, if they're vegan, if they're omnivore, you have to tailor those protein sources. So keep in mind, tryptophan, tryptophan is a key amino acid, which can lead to uh, further production of serotonin and melatonin. Now, when we think of sleep, uh, and many times there's poor sleep quality, and that can come from emotional reasons, mental reasons, you know, we're ruminating late at night, we're on the computer too late, too much blue light, lots of different reasons for poor sleep quality, everything from blood sugar imbalance, which might be tied to our stress balance or imbalance, Hormones may be a factor as well, like the sex hormones, women going through perimenopause or if they're postmenopausal, or even through um, the monthly cycle of a menstruating woman, she can have changes in sleep as well. So we need to look at the environment that they're sleeping in, ask about chronic health issues that they might have, any kind of pain that might come up, and then to really look at what they're eating and what time of day they're eating these foods. So making sure again, that we bring in low glycemic eating, high protein foods, let's make sure that we get those amino acids in there throughout the day, lower inflammation with anti-inflammatory foods, and even include foods that are high in melatonin. I know that we're hearing a lot about melatonin, and I would say that melatonin is very intriguing. Um, you know, we find it, it, it's made in animals and it's made in plants. So what we're going to find is that having more melatonin rich foods may in fact help improve sleep. And in fact, you know, how does it do that? Well, it's, it's changing our circadian rhythm. It's doing a lot of different things. Actually, the more I look into it, we see lots of different mechanisms. It's a potent antioxidant. Um, it has anti-inflammatory activity. It modulates the immune system. And it contributes to so many other different features of our cardiometabolic health, as well as our neuronal health. So I do think that there's more for us to understand about melatonin as a hormone and to keep in mind that yes, our pineal gland does produce melatonin, but our gut produces greater, you know, many, many more, um, <laughs> higher levels and at greater times throughout the day, we're, we're getting melatonin from the gut that would seem to coincide with meals. So, you know, the, the gut is a huge source of melatonin, but we can get food sources of melatonin. So bringing in things like nuts and seeds and grains and things like germinating, sprouting, and even roasting can change the amount of melatonin in, in these particular foods. So there is also, I want to mention, um, lots of different kinds of supplemental melatonins on the market. Many of them, unless they state where, where the source is, uh, they tend to be synthetic forms of melatonin. So, uh, in this particular study that was published in molecules just recently in 2021, 
they looked at a head-to-head -head study of plant-based melatonin compared to synthetic melatonin and found that the plant-based melatonin did much better when it came to things like reducing inflammation and also having a better free radical scavenging activity. Now this was done in cell systems just so that you can compare them more neatly without having the influence of the entire endocrine system. So I, I do advocate much more in the way of plants because we get the complexity and the particular phytomelatonin that was used within this cellular study was derived from a plant complex. So there were other things in it like chlorophyll and beta carotene. The other thing that I think is important to help us with sleep that is nutritional is lutein. This is another class of a phytonutrient. It belongs within the carotenoid family. Lutein is one of the best protectors against the effects of blue light. Let's just say that somebody has to be exposed to blue light, whether it's smartphones, it's an iPad, it's a computer, just even uh, commercial lighting. And so helping the eye to be protected, and we know that lutein and zeaxanthin are the two carotenoids that localize in the macula that can be very protective. So having food sources of lutein may also be something to incorporate to nourish the, the, the pineal aspect of the endocrine circuit. All right, we're at our close, and I want to just do kind of a, a whirlwind here to bring it together, the, this final symphonic summary. Uh, I, and I know I didn't talk a lot about lifestyle really, but um, I, you know, as well as I do that how we eat is connected to so much. And so we do need to be thinking about not just what we eat, but then also how we move, how we breathe, how we feel connecting those feelings, those emotions into our eating. Sleep is huge. How we sleep one night can change how we eat the next day. What are our relationships like? How do we relax? How do we align to the circadian rhythm? When do we wake up? When do we go to bed? So lots of different ways to optimize the endocrine system by looking at stress, mind body techniques, spending time in nature can be so incredibly healing. Um, getting some more physical activity and really tailoring these practices to the client that you're working with. I mean, you may love meditation, but it may not be for your client. So having a list of lifestyle strategies, kind of like a little menu for people to pick and choose from so that they know that they have options. I do think that looking at smoking and alcohol, trying to lessen inflammation and even, you know, during this time of having the pandemic, you know, how do we get more back in person? You know, another um, really important hormone is, is oxytocin and really helping uh, us look at something like oxytocin, having this love compound, this love um, molecule circulating within us, helping us to feel safe just through, through healthy touch, just being able to be around people and to feel that sense of community. I think that, you know, that's something that we've missed. <laughs> so how do we bring that back? Even that is changing our endocrine circuit. All right. So I did mention to you that I would come back full circle to creativity. And just very quickly, since I feel so passionate about this, I just want to show you that there's science behind creativity. Many clients are going to say to you, Deanna, um, you know, I, I just don't think that I have time to be creative. Well, being creative is part of healing. It enables better expression of ourselves. It helps us with burnout and emotional stress. It can help us overall just with emotionally venting and allowing whatever is bubbling up within us to come out and to be seen and to do that in healthy ways that may even create an art piece or a music piece or a, a poem. So it does cultivate more resilience. It creates a sense of purpose and meaning, and it may even change cravings. So really interesting science on creativity that is out there. I just want to show you, these are some ideas that you might want to, to show to clients and, and keep in mind too, that, you know, creativity is not on a canvas all the time. Sometimes it's about how we think 
It's about how we move through the day. It's about being outside in nature. It's about being around children and letting yourself play. It could be having a coloring book and just coloring or doodling. So keep in mind that creativity is creative. (laughs) It needs to be creative. We need to take some creativity into how we see the creative life force within our everyday. I do think that this is really healing for our emotions. All right. So I'm not going to focus on this. I'm just going to show this to you quickly. There's so many different materials. My previous webinar went through this much more extensively. I'm just bringing it back and kind of sealing in all of these pieces so that we're building upon the information. So the macros, healthy quality protein, looking at reduced glycemic impact carbs and healthy fats, really important. People don't eat macronutrients. They eat foods. How we put those different foods together for a better complement of macronutrients is the art of what you're very skilled at. Looking at vitamins, the full spectrum of different ones, thinking about the fat solubles, A, D, E, and K, looking at the water solubles. And again, remembering that we may have dehydration or changes in how we hydrate when we're stressed, bringing in those water soluble vitamins as well, the B complex, as well as vitamin C. Minerals, my goodness, you know, minerals are key. There are so many of them. There are macro minerals, micro minerals, and ultra trace. And these essential minerals can help to protect us from the effects of heavy metals. They many times are cofactors relating to the synthesis of hormones, neurotransmitters, and even the metabolic cycles. So making sure that we have enough minerals from things that are in our food. Phytonutrients, uh, bringing those in for antioxidant protection, helping us with stress response, building up and fortifying the gut microbiome and helping people to have more joy through the eating experience by engaging them with the colors that they're eating. This is why I talk about eating the rainbow, because when people eat eat colorful foods, they're going to live a colorful life. It's more engaging to look at these foods and it translates in terms of the science. What we see is that eating more of these colorful fruits and vegetables, the whole array has been associated with less psychological distress, better mood, greater happiness, flourishing, and well-being. I listed the studies here below, all looking at how fruits and vegetables change our mental health. So it's not just that eating more fruits and vegetables reduce the risk for chronic disease. I know that probably most people intuitively know that, that it's really important to eat them. They know that for their body. They don't always know that fruits and vegetables are important for their mental health. That's the new piece to bring into your conversation with them. So with more fruits and vegetables, greater life satisfaction score is what you see here. It just goes up. So increasing fruit and vegetable intake up to eight servings per day was positively associated with happiness, life satisfaction, and well-being. And you could say, well, how do you actually measure that? Well, in this particular study, what they found was that it was the same level of transitioning from unemployment, not having a job to having a job. That degree of satisfaction or contentment was what you saw when people had more fruits and vegetables, again, up to that eight servings per day. You've probably heard me talk about eating the rainbow talking about the color code, I do have a paper that you can download and read more about. So there's not just the art of eating the rainbow, there's also the science behind it. So each color of food correlates to a different functional signature. And if you're interested, you can use my food and mood weekly tracker with your clients. It's on my website, people can use it as they would like. Essentially what it does is it wakes people up to their foods and their moods so that they can start to see the pattern of how the colors of their foods might be correlated to the colors of their moods. And I explain in the directions what each of the colors represents so that when you describe it and you explain it, that you can say, okay, here are the the colors. This is what they mean. At the end of the day, you can just very simply do a quick check mark of what colors of foods did you have? What were the colors of your moods and see if there's a connection.
So this might be, this is a sample of just for myself, just putting it together and looking at what I was feeling and what I was eating. And from this one page, you can have such a robust conversation about nutrition and their emotional mental health. Variety, I want to toss this in before we close. Really important to change up the foods that we're taking in. Greater variety of fruits and vegetables was associated with a higher mini mental state exam score and cognitive domains such as executive function, memory, and attention. That's huge. So if our brain works better, we are sharper uh, because we're eating a variety of fruits and vegetables. That's really something to tout in the therapeutic encounter. Children with less dietary diversity and dietary adequacy had greater anxiety. That was shown in a, a different study. And it was also shown that women with less dietary diversity had greater associations with anxiety and depression. So maybe people won't, you know, they're, they're already getting their fruits and vegetables, but they might be in a rut where they're not getting enough variety of those fruits and vegetables. So I have taken um, Dr. Miguel Toribio Mateus's wonderful, um, he calls it a 50 food challenge chart in which you would write in all the different foods that you're taking in. So I took that and modified it a, a little bit to make it um, just a little bit more categorical so that when people filled it out, they would put their vegetables here, fruits, herbs, spices in this category, um, nuts and seeds over here, whole grains, liquids, just to help to organize and quickly see, can I get at least 50 unique plant-based foods in seven days? So it's just one way to, again, engage your clients in getting more variety. All right. Wonderful. I hope that this has been useful. Uh, first and foremost, I really do think that there's an opportunity here for you as a nutrition professional to begin the conversation with your clients on food and mood and that interconnection. So many different ways that you can approach this. You can do it by talking about foods bringing in dietary supplements, connecting into lifestyle habits. And what I don't want us to leave behind is really the foundational aspects, right? Just making sure that we can help the foundational aspects of the diet with the macronutrients, and then looking at the foundational aspects of lifestyle, looking at stress, looking at stressors, because that can be very depleting overall of the entire endocrine circuit. We start to get noise uh, from this this, uh, I, I would say like this orchestra, right? We want it to be a harmonic symphony that is pleasant to hear, right? Where, where people feel really in sync with their own inner music. So food and mood are interconnected, the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual aspects. So as I like to say, eat the rainbow for your inner rainbow. And when you're eating colorful foods, you can have some colorful moods as well. So thank you, everybody. Hope that this was useful and inspiring for you. Take care.